we did high Thank you, Amna. We highly recommend <laughs> that you are on camera. Um, again, it, these sessions will also be available on uh, YouTube in a couple of days. Uh, so if you're unable to catch it one Thursday, you can go to YouTube maybe a couple of days after. We're working on the schedule of when it will be uploaded to YouTube. We'll definitely share that link out. Um, and also, please make sure you are sharing the flyer with your friends and family members. Um, uh, you can also share the link. Uh, there is a share button in this Zoom. So please share out the link. We want to not just impact ourselves, but also impact the life of others. Because as we are, again, here to talk about God's word, uh, we're not, again, just impacting ourselves. We want to be impacting the world. God has called us to be disciples. So please also wear your disciple hat and share the content that we have going on. Uh, and that's my spiel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miss Bella. And so we'll dive right into it. The book of uh, Ruth, chapter one. Again, I will just read the chapter one, go back to some historical data. And the platform is open for insights, contributions, subtractions. Um, however you understand it, please share it on the platform. We are here to learn from one another. I am Chapin Zion. And then Miss Bella, you take over as to however you want to orchestrate this whole thing. Does that work? You're on mute. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and read chapter one. And then or does Valerie or Miss Bella, any one of you can read it and I can do a historical um, data on it. Okay, I can read. All right. Okay, so chapter one, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Um, Elimech moves his family to Moab. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimech died and Naomi was left with her two sons the two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Opa, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malan and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Should I proceed? Yes. Okay. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughter-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to the, her homeland. With her two daughters, with her two daughters in law, she set out from the place where she had been had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters in law, Go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with security at, sorry, with security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you. You we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons? Would you grow up to be your, that will grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again, 
They wept together and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi, she said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, do not ask me, do not ask me to leave you and turn and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned to Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the Barley Fest. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. This is a wonderful story. One would ask, oh, why did this book even come into the Bible? Why did God even allow this book to be part of the Bible? So let's go back from verse. I'm just going to give a little bit of summary and history, and then we all chip in. We see that it says that in the days when the judges governed Israel, um, if you look at historical data, that season, that moment, or that let's say years, were difficult years for the people of Israel. And so you see that the Bible says that there was famine in the land of Canaan and a certain man in Bethlehem. And so because of famine, because of struggle, because of um, difficult times in seeking food, food for the family, Ahimelech, which is Naomi's husband, decided to migrate the whole family, his two sons and wife, um, to the land of Moab. Moab is another ancient enemy of Israel. So let's look at it this way. You are in farming, you're struggling in Ghana, you're struggling, I don't know where uh, Rebecca is from, but you're struggling in Cameroon and you're seeking for another place to go. Some of us migrated to America, some migrated to London or some were even born in London, but then we decide to migrate to Ghana's worst enemy to seek for food. So that is the story over there that Ahimelech, Naomi and his, and his two sons, um, they migrated to um, Moab. Now, when they get to Moab, you know, of course they do get married. Valerie will strongly argue about some punishments later on, we'll hear about it. And we see that these two sons of um, Naomi now marry Moabites women. So I just want to give us a little bit of history about this marriage, interracial marriage, if you want to call it, or international marriage. Because they were enemies of Israel, there was also a decree or a commandment in Deuteronomy that they were not supposed to marry foreign women. So that was a law that was set in standard by Moses. And so we see that these uh, boys or these young men marrying such women. Now, what is the big deal about the people of Moab, the people of Moab or Naomi? If you read the whole text or the whole book, it, it, it references Naomi as Naomi, the, the Moabite. It doesn't just stop at now. Uh, I'm sorry, Ruth. It says Ruth, the Moabite, Ruth, the Moabite. Why that extension of name of the Moabite? Why is it attached to her actual name? When we read the Bible, um, let me see. In Genesis 19, verses 30 to 38, I want to give us a glimpse of the culture, the tradition, how the people of Moab worshipped, what God they worshipped, what they actually did, so that we can understand where now uh, Ruth is coming from. We can understand her culture. We can understand the sacrifices she made. We can understand what her circumstance was. We can understand why she decided to really click to Naomi and not return to her people. Because if we read Genesis um, 19, verse 30, from 19, I'm sorry, Genesis 19, 30 to 38, 
Um, let me see. I can, we, it talks about Lot and his daughters. We know that Lot is the nephew of, what's his name again? Are we have, do we have Bible scholars on the line? Lot is the nephew of who? No problem. Abraham, is that right? You're mute, darling, Marion. <laughs> I was going to say he's Abraham's brother. Exactly. Uh, nephew, right? His nephew. And so Lot is the one, of course, that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what happened, the great story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the angels of the Lord came to deliver him from Sodom and Gomorrah with his children because his wife looked um, behind and she was turned into a pillar of salt. We know that great story from um, um, when we're growing up and went to Sunday school at church. So we see that now Lot and his daughters, they've left Sodom and Gomorrah. And Genesis 19, 30 to 38 is telling us that now these young women realize that, listen, we've left Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't have any man to marry, to let alone have children. So they decided to plan a plot. Let's get our father drunk and let's sleep with him so that we can bear children and have a family, have um, a gene genealogy or have some, something you know, that we can call our own. And so the first daughter gets the father drunk and sleeps with the father. And then she comes back and she tells the second sister, hey, this is what I've just done. It's your turn to go in. The second daughter goes in, gets the father drunk and sleeps with the father. That was the foundation of the Moabites. We'll go, in, we'll go deeper into it. And so both of them, both of these young women, they end up having children, sons, and they call them the Moabites. So that's the first foundation. If we go on to Numbers 25, Verse one to five, also we see that here, the people, um, the king of Moab was being attacked. There was battle, there was war. Maybe it's actually second Kings. So you can make reference to numbers 25, one to five, and then you can make reference to second Kings three, 21 to 27. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to give us a picture of the people of Moab, where Ruth came from. And we wanna see that although her culture was so bad, Although her people worshiped idols, although her people ignored the precepts of God, God in his merciful infinite wisdom decided to pull a woman out of that culture called Ruth and use her to be the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That is the mercy of God, the grace of God. And so we, we, we're going to go delve deeper into it and then Marian and then uh, Valerie will step in right, right away. So in 2 Kings 3, 21 to 27, let me read from 26. When the king of Moab, that is where Ruth comes from, saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he was under attack, they were being fought. Uh, then again, those times there was a lot of battles going on. But when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. Then the king of Moab took his eldest son, who reigned in his place and offered him publicly as a burnt offering to Camos. Camos was a god that they, they worshipped. And so we see the story here that the people of Moab, how did it start? Two daughters decide to sleep with their father. It's an incest. They decide to sleep with their father and they have kids. Now these are, they call them the Moabs and the Moabites and then Edomites, I think. Marion, you can reference me and correct me on that. And then secondly, we see that the king of Moab is under attack. He's under great war, you know, warfare. What does he do? He picks up his own, his own son, the one who will replace him when he dies. He picks him up and offers him as a sacrifice to a god. So these people are into prostitution. These people are into sacrifice, sacrificing their children and offering them to gods. That if you read other historical data, they will tell you that Ruth was being prepared as a princess one day to be offered as a sacrifice. So we see the whole story is like a deliverance session going on here. When Ruth in her right senses makes the right choice, but Oprah goes back to her gods. So that is the history. We have the woman that God has picked, God has chosen, although her 
culture or some will say her, her family background is so bad because they worship idols, they make children sacrifices, they are into prostitution, they can sleep with their uncles, they can sleep with their fathers, they can sleep with their father's wives and have no remorse. That was the type of culture and tradition that Ruth came out of. And so Valerie will argue, you know, because these people were so, the famine that was in Bethlehem, then now Ahimelech moves Naomi and the two sons to Moab. And when they get to Moab, they don't just stay there. Now they intermarry these Moabite women, which was against God's precepts or God's law. And so maybe that, uh, Marion, you can take over from here, interject the platform is open, but this is a little historical data. We can go a little bit more into depth in the verse one, chapter one, before we move to chapter two. So please, the platform is open. And Marion, please take over. I don't know what you want to do from here. Thank you, Abuna. Um, I mean, well, you pretty much covered it all. But what I do want to say is that, you know, a lot of times in the Bible, God uses famine to release a harvest. Anytime there's famine in the land, there's always a harvest around the corner. It's kind of like when every time a storm hits, after the storm passes, the sun always shines. There's never been a storm that the sun does not come after. Uh, the rain or the thunderstorms or the lightning. The sun will always shine after the storm. So um, just by reading the context, we know that, you know, greatness had had, greatness took place. Um, maybe not in the way Naomi wanted it to take place, but it did. I want to go over some of the meanings of the names that we we're going to be uncovering or the characters we're going to be talking about in the story. So Ruth means a vision of beauty. Uh, it also means companion and compassionate, as well as friends. So it's, it's important what we what we're called. I mean, our names are very important. It's also important what you name your children, right? Um, we're gonna learn it later on. Talk about Boaz, but I do want to you know explain what his name means. His name means strength. It means swiftness, strong, mighty, fierceness, uh, to bring into refuge and safety. Uh, Elimek. Uh, also means God is king in Hebrew. Naomi means my delight, pleasant and sweet. And she, we saw what Naomi did. She was literally acting in the complete polar opposite of what her name meant because she was so disheartened and broken. And I mean, you know, we can understand why she was feeling like that. And of course had every right to. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. And then Malon means man of sickness and Kilion means wasting away. So it's, it's really important, um, especially with the kid names, the, the young boys that, you know, they were named after just things that, I mean, not mostly wicked things, but, you know, why would you name your son sickness? <laughs> or why would you name your son wasting away? You know, those are not uh, good names. So can we, you know, be surprised at what happened to them? Mm, no, we can't, because I mean, that's what they were called. And so I really want to hone in on El Elimek. Um, if we look at him, right, he actually was evidently very wealthy um, because of where the tribe or lineage he came from. Um, and uh, Ephrathite is derived from the word Ephrat. Sorry, my Hebrew was bad, <laughs> which means fruitful. So he actually came from money, you know? And when I was, when I was, I was, I was reading and just doing my research, God, okay, in this text, we did, we did not hear anything from God. In the days of Judges, he barely spoke. We did not hear anything from him. He did not, and typically when you, when you see someone move in the Bible, God is the one that tells them, okay, I need you to move from A to Z. And if he doesn't tell you to move, something bad typically happens and he has to stretch his hand from heaven and come and save you, you know? Look at Moses, what happened to Moses when Moses didn't do what he was supposed to do and he got in trouble. Look at Abraham when him and Sarah went to Egypt and then, you know, she almost got, someone tried to sleep with her and then he had to lie and say that was his sister. You know, he got into a whole mess. So I think it's important here. God didn't tell Elimek to move. He didn't. And even though there was famine in the land of Judah, Bethlehem, so wealthy people remained. 
as we will talk about in chapter two. I don't want to jump the gun, but Boaz, he remained. He didn't move. He remained. So it, it made me question, okay, well, was Elimek, was he scared with, about losing his wealth? Did he feel like, okay, the wealth I've acquired or inherited, it may deplete because of the famine. Let me go to Moab so I can preserve my wealth. And then also too, he, they were there for a while because you know, it said 10 years later, the sons died, right? So he was, it, it seemed like some of the Moabites and they were Israelites, they got along with each other because you didn't hear anything bad about you know, them clashing or whatnot. So um, it just made me question, okay, well, God didn't tell him to leave. And if I do my research, he actually came from a wealthy family. So he had wealth. There was no reason for him to leave. Maybe he was scared of losing what he had acquired. And I think it's important that, you know, if, we, if there's something great or big that we have to do in life, we should always get clarification uh, and clearance from God to make sure, okay, this is what he wants us to do. I'm not saying that he died because he moved. Uh, we, we honestly don't know. Like, I mean, I, and I don't want to use my own doctrine in this, but I'm just, you know, reading between the lines. And I mean, please chime in with your thoughts um, in regards to this. I don't want to ramble. I want to give everybody the opportunity to talk as well. Amen. Um, One of the things I'll add to it is if someone else is coming online is to say that opera means that ones who turn um, their back on God, because we see that Ruth said, wherever you go, I would go. Wherever you die, I would die. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. That means from what I've also researched on is that she is connecting to Naomi's God. But when opera said, listen, okay, I'm going to go because you're sending me away. She's going back to her culture. She's going back to the idols, to Kamos. She's going back to the old traditional systems. Although she's tasted of God, she's going back to what she's known because the husband is no more. Right? So that's the, and it's, it's kind of ironic that Oprah names her name like that. Oprah Winfrey that we know, because at this time that as we speak, I don't know if she's changed, but She's turned her back on God. So again, how you name your children is very important. Even if it's a biblical name, it has to be a positive, you know, meaning to it because Oprah is in the Bible, but it means someone who turns her back on God, like I found out today. Um, again, did you want to hone in before we go to chapter two or please go ahead? Yes. Rebecca has a question. Go ahead. Rebecca, Be please. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, it wasn't necessarily a question, but it was more so just um, what I got from that that passage, which was really informative in terms of uh, all the names, all the history. But there was something that um, Marion said in terms of in the Bible, whenever there was like famine, after that, there was like, you know, always something positive that came out of it. And it just made me just think about, what did it make me think about? Sorry, one second. It, it made me think about just asking God for, for a sign and in, and in all your ways acknowledging him. And I truly believe on that. I truly try to live my life that way. Like if there is, if I've asked God for a sign or if I feel like God's trying to tell me something, I try to lean my ears to listen to it. Um, and it was just so telling that in the Bible, like that is like a clear indication of like, hey, if you weren't given a sign or something like, you know, do your best to, to really register that and not, and, and be still is my point. So it was just really interesting to, to hear it in, in that way. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Valerie has a question. No, it's just a contribution to what was already said. You know, you talk about farming, you talk about harvest, you know, when we, when we read it, you know, God, can you hear me? Oh, okay. So, you know, yes, farming comes, farming comes and harvest, uh, harvest uh, comes after the farming. But what brings the farming? What brings the hardship? It's our disobedience. It's because we don't work according to what God has commanded us to work. God has promised the Israelite that he will not leave them. He will always have uh, reigns in their land but 
that is in the one condition if you obey the commandment. I think we read it in Deuteronomy. Is it Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 11, verse uh, 13 to 17. You say God promised the Israelite that he will always provide, but they disobey God. That's why the famine came into the land. So when things happen in our lives, yes, we have harvest after that, but what brings the famine is our disobedience. So we disobey, you say the famine came into the land. And another thing, uh, Elimelech disobeyed to God. He moved from that uh, area to another one. And not only that, when he reached that land, he disobeyed God once more time. The kids, the, the sons got married to the Moabites. And God did not allow them to do that. So for, for, uh, after, after the famine, yes, we have harvest, but what do we do for the, to have the harvest? We have to return to God, just like Naomi did. Naomi went back to God, and we will see how her life has changed after, after that. So we have to trust God. We have to obey God and listen to him. Move according to God's words, not according to our own, not take our own survival upon our upon ourselves. That is a very good argument because she made that argument last week as well. Um, and looking back, Marion, either is always farming. And I think that was a norm for the people of Israel. Um, mm -hmm. Even when they left Egypt, going to something that should have taken them like think 40 days it was taking them 40 years because of disobedience there was always they were always getting into trouble with their enemies whatsoever so i guess you do have a point and I, I accept it now i think last week i don't know why i didn't accept it but disobedience comes with some some form of i guess some punishment maybe their case was i don't know maybe very unique because god had already planned from the beginning of the world that he was going to use naomi's family to bring about the, the historical um, and family history of Jesus. And so maybe that was their punishment. I, I don't think everyone that disobeyed God at the time, I really don't know, got that severe kind of punishment where the father died and two sons died, right? And so that, that's very severe. But in the same vein, we see that God still wanted to use that family to make a point, to bring about history. So that I agree with you too on that. So that's a very good point. And if we are going to see harvest after we've disobeyed, our return to Christ is what brings us the harvest. Our repentance is what brings the fruitfulness. So I think that's also a very good point. Please, Minister Leslie, Mama Clote, if there's any contribution that uh, Minister uh, Rebecca, please still chip in. We'll, from chapter two is getting juicy. And that's what we want to hear more of Leslie into this. So please, um, Maya, you want to say something? You're muted, darling. Yeah, I do. Sorry. Yeah, I, I realized I was muted. Um, well, I, does anybody else? I don't want to speak before the other ones that haven't spoken yet. Um, Mrs. Cote and Leslie. Okay, I think I'll go. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, you can I, I, you can check the comments. I left the. Uh, okay. Yeah, I saw you put something in there. All right. Cool. Let me um, read. Maybe Jay keeps crying. So. so Leslie put Proverbs three. Um, verse five to six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not the part of your heart. Love it. That's so true. We should with all our heart and we shouldn't uh, be double-minded or doubt God, you know, when he gives us specific instructions or gives us warnings. Uh, so that's true. Thank you for the input, Leslie. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about the, the, the part in the scripture where uh, Ruth was resilient and determined to go with Naomi. She was like, I'm not going back, I'm coming with you. I believe too that, that at that moment, Ruth denounced her gods. I mean, clearly, sorry, she denounced her gods and accepted the most high, as they referred to him back in that time, the most high God. She like accepted him as a Lord and her savior. 
and went on with Naomi to the promised land. She realized that her tribe, where she came from, was just full of debauchery. It was no good. Killing of the innocent children. She could have been killed when she was little. I don't know if you guys have taken the time to watch the movie Ruth, but if you haven't, maybe watch it over the weekend. It's a really good movie. It's two hours long, it's on YouTube, but um, it's a really good movie. And of course they add in their own you know, thesis, but it's really good if you have time. But like, she could have been sacrificed. There's so many things that could have happened to her up into her adulthood. And she realized that, you know, where I come from, they're not real. Like there's something about them that I don't want to go back to. I want to come with you. I want to be where you, I will serve your God. Your God will be my God. And only death can separate us. That Ruth was obedient. She was loyal. She was selfless. Um, she had all the attributes of what us as women should have, you know, um, and she also, we're going to see later on other characteristics of Ruth when she encounters, uh, Boaz, but, and, and, you know, me and my friend Becky were talking today and she, she said she was, uh, when she was reading the script and hopefully you don't mind me sharing this Bex, you know, she said she saw how much value Ruth added to Boaz and to my Naomi. She was the one that told, well, I don't, okay, let me not go to, we're going back to go in chapter two. I don't want to go in too much. <laughs> but um, we see that right here in chapter one, that, you know, the, the good characteristics of Ruth. So I don't want us to overlook that, especially the woman, especially if we're already, you know, preparing ourselves to get married or remarried, whatever. Like these are things that we have to instill within ourselves. And if we don't carry these characteristics or carry ourselves as such, then we need to start making some changes. Amen. Okay. Amen. I think we can go to chapter chapter two. Does someone want to say something? Uh, no, uh, Becky said, go ahead. Sorry, she was saying I can go ahead and show what we talked about earlier today. Thanks, Bex. <laughs> All right. Okay, so chapter two. One second, sorry. One second. Okay, Ruth chapter two. Ruth works in Boaz's field. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimech. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimech. While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she is the young woman of Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She had been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness? Some scriptures say favor. She asked, I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know that 
about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not one of your workers. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with his harvesters and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain among the sheaves without stopping her and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back into town and she and showed it to her mother-in-law. Ruth also gave the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Where did you gather all this grain today? Naomi asked. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I worked with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi told her daughter-in-law. He is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. Then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire festival harvest is completed. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, my daughter, stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but, with, but you'll be safe with him. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley fest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. Amen. I know that you 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 are you are, you are eager to share your point of view. Please go ahead. We'll chip in, as as and when, Miss Marion. Um, this is a beautiful love story. Uh, you see, an, an older man uh, called Boaz, um, and and of course we we don't know how old Boaz is. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but we, we'll find out. But we realize that he's much older than than Ruth is. And so, Maria, I'll let you take over because I know this is your niche. Um, <laughs> just let her take over and educate us on it. But we see that Boaz is a much older man throughout this and what he does for Naomi. But the most important thing is what Naomi did, how she treated her mother, her mother-in-law, which is Naomi, and what Ruth did um, to her mother-in-law. That gave her a good report wherever she went. It was a good name. So I think that's the lesson that I want to take out of this based on because there's no way Boaz should have shown her favor if her history, if her report, if it had stated, hey, she treated her mother-in-law badly, she wouldn't have obtained any favor. That, that one, I, be, that one I, I believe so. And so how we treat people, whether it's a mother-in-law, whether it's a brother-in-law, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a sister, we do not know where our help is gonna come from in the future or who's gonna give us a referral for somebody to bless us. And I think there's a typical story. Marion, take over, or Valerie, whoever wants to say something. And please, um, everyone is open, Minister Leslie, Mama Clote. Hey, Faith, welcome, we missed you. Um, it would be nice to see your face, but if you can't show your face, that's okay. Um, Miss Bella, you can take over. There she is. <laughs> I think she's driving home from church. Thanks for joining. Okay. No problem. Uh, uh, Marion, so dissect it. Break it down as to what you think Boaz is. And, and let Minister Leslie, this is where we're going to need your input as a man. 
And we, we're, we're not trying to hit on you as a man, but we want, this is what women, let me back up. This is what women seek for in men before they get married or we look for certain things. But at the same time, women, we need to position ourselves um, in the right place at the right time so that we can also obtain such favor from the man that God is sending our way. So Marion, take over. Hi, sorry, I had to adjust my lighting. Um, so yeah, let's dissect this. Okay, so first one. So Boaz was a wealthy and influential man, okay? So now where she's, this is where Ruth is like being introduced to her, you know, soon to be hubby, okay? So there's some key nuggets that I want us to take from this. Um, number one, before God gave Adam Eve, he gave Adam a job, okay? He made sure Adam had a job and Adam had provision and finances to be able to take care of Eve. As we see here, it, it, no one's saying your husband has to be a multi-millionaire or billionaire or whatever, but he has to have some form of job or wealth to be able to take care of you, okay? Also, Boaz did his research on who Ruth was. It's very important, and whether you're a man or a woman, you need to do your research on your spouse. I believe in, you know, there's another side, there's phys the physical research, and then you have spiritual research. You have to do your spiritual investigation because that's actually more important than the actual physical investigation. But he, he was able to get information from his workers, and I'm sure he asked other people, because when he talked to her, he told her everything he had found out. And then um, Boaz, he prayed for Ruth. He gave her words of affirmation. He, uh, he protected her countless times in the scripture. We saw him, he was protective over her. He made sure she ate, he served her. So there's nothing wrong with men serving their women from time to time. I'm not saying that you have to serve us 24 seven, but occasionally it's okay for a, a man to serve his woman. If you read in the scripture, it says that Boaz was the one that served her the grain. There is nothing wrong from time to time to, to you know, like being served by your man. I, I, when I read this, I was like, huh, you know, that's refreshing, you know, especially coming from, you know, an African culture, women are taught to, you know, always serve the man and blah, blah, blah. But occasionally, sometimes it's refreshing if a man serves a woman, right? Um, Boaz made sure she, she ate. He made sure she was fed. He made, he made her work light. He intentionally told his workers that, listen, pick the, pick the greens and, and intentionally drop it on the floor on purpose to make it easier for her to pick it up. They, and they did not even question him when he said that, you know? So any man that comes into your life that says, oh, he wants to marry you or be with you, he is one supposed to protect you. He's supposed to make your work light and easy. He's supposed to speak at words of affirmation to you. He's supposed to pray over you. And most importantly, he is supposed to protect you. He protected her on countless occasions. She was a foreigner and he was well aware of that. And he even upgraded her. He leveled her up because when Ruth came in with humility, she told, she said, okay, let me just, and let me ask the workers if I can just glean behind them or, or, or pick up the grain behind, you know, the workers and just kind of stay in the lowly position because she knew her place. She was in a foreign land. She didn't want to overstep boundaries, you know? So she came in with humility, but he came, he was like, nah, I got you, you know, Follow my workers, you're good now. And then my workers are gonna make the work easy for you. So anytime you meet your potential spouse or whoever, if he, if he is truly the one that God said he, that will marry you or uh, take you from your mother's home or wherever, he is supposed to uh, add some type of value into you. And he is supposed to invest in you. Boaz invested in Ruth. You know, we're not talking about basic investment where he just buys you, puts gas in your car or, or, you know, buys you a plane ticket. That's just transportation. You know, he invested in her. You know what I'm saying? So there's a, a level of investment that a man is supposed to make. Um, but again, he did all these things because he saw that she was, you know, some scriptures say that she was a virtuous woman. She was a virtuous woman. So he knew the qualities and attributes that this, that, uh, that Ruth had. So he knew the, the level of value she was adding to Naomi and that she could possibly bring to him. 
So he wasn't reluctant in helping her. It was very easy for him, you know what I'm saying? So I, I want us to take away those nuggets. Those, those really spoke to me when I read this, chap uh, this chapter. And I think as we continue to read, we'll see um, their dynamics. But that's all I'll say for now. I really want everybody else to talk. Amen. And <laughs> uh, Minister Claude, Mama Lucy, any words of wisdom for us? Um, I think one, two, three, four. Maybe. Faith as well. Four of these ladies, we are um, in pursuit of God's um, workman or handyman or servant for our lives. And so this is something that we are going to apply to our lives as, as women, young women, old women, um, seeking for the right spouse, the right ordained man for our lives. And so we're taking, we're not taking this lightly. We are applying for these these precepts to our life. Minister Clotte, is there any view from a man's perspective that you want to <laughs> you want to throw at us oh mama we are looking for wisdom because one of the things that Ruth did was listen to Naomi and last week we were saying that Naomi became like a mentor to Ruth where she was guided by her and then she listened to her mentor and she, because Naomi had experience she had knowledge she had wisdom to give to her daughter-in-law in, you know, because her husband is no more. So she took care of her as well. Um, please, the platform is opened. Faith, Valerie. Oh, Miss Rebecca has dropped off. You said she was going to drop off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, the one thing I do want to say is that, uh, well, you know what? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I was, since no one's talking, hopefully someone talks after I speak, is that when she left, Boaz made sure she had more than enough and she never left him empty handed. Never. Like he made sure she was covered. He made sure she had everything she needed. He even made sure she had food to take home to Naomi. That is. The other part is, although he made these things easy for her, Ruth was a hardworking woman. Yes, she was. She didn't stop working because she was being provided for. Right. She was an idol. And, you know, it goes to, you know, a lot of, especially these days with women, we just think, okay, oh, hey, I'm just going to sit here and mope around and wait for our man to show up. No, you're not supposed to be idle. You're supposed to be actively working. And that's important. Yeah. So thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Leslie is not going to talk today, Abby. <laughs> no, Leslie be having a lot to say. He has a lot to say. I don't know why he has a lot to say. <laughs> Just what I had my thoughts around, she just mentioned it, so I don't know if um, uh, talking about how they complemented each other. Um, there's one thing to be received and another thing to be accepted. So you go to a place, they receive, say, oh, come in, have a seat, that kind of thing. And if they accept you, they go above and beyond to make sure that you have every thing you need to succeed and that is what he did for her um they received her but then he made sure he went beyond, above and beyond to make sure that she's comfortable in the role that she was playing and then as you said she didn't abuse that that she um also was very hard working so you see how they are complementing each other where um yes the man had work he protected and he served her he did all those things, um, which I am, uh, reminds me of this video of uh, Miles Monroe that I was watching where he was talking about um, what a man should have, or uh, like some requirements men should meet before they even think about marrying. You have to have work. Um, you have to know God, these, all these things that he shared. So yeah, some of those principles are in here, but um, I just wanted to point out the fact that they complemented each other. Yes, he didn't only um, receive her, but he accepted her and made sure that she was um, comfortable so that she could um, do um, her best. And then she didn't abuse it, but um, took, took that as an opportunity to also um, work hard. So that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to say one more thing, and uh, Faith and, and Mama, if you're if you're available to say something, we'll, we'll appreciate it. The other thing is, oh, just keep my mind. Um, oh, bummer. Marion, if you have something to say, it just it just left my mind right now. What I wanted to say. Um, yes, to bring it home for the young uh -huh. lady. Oh, go ahead, listen. 
Why did he call her, her his daughter? Yeah, that's why I mentioned previously that there was an age, there was a gap. He was much older. Mm -hmm. um, according to the data, I think he was um, either the nephew of Naomi's husband, Ahimelech. So if he's a nephew of Naomi's husband, that is, he was much older than, um, of course, Naomi's son that Ruth married. That's the only logical explanation I can give that, that you know, there was a huge age gap. And I think in verse chapter three, you will, he mentions it that way. Um, um, there's a text there that to indicate about the, the, the gap. That's the only explanation I can come up with. So I think to me, there's nothing wrong with marrying an older man. <laughs> That's my, 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 that's my perception about this. But Leslie, that's all I have right now. We can do some more research to it. But yeah. um, I think that he was much older than Naomi. Um, I'm, I beg your pardon, than Ruth. Um, okay. The lessons that I'm taking from this is when you meet someone, I was in a bad relationship where I worked as a man. So to all of us, the young ladies on here, now that we've seen this, yes, we need to be in a position that we are working, we are hardworking, um, whether in ministry, whether in corporate America, whether in our own businesses or whatsoever, it is a good place to be. But when a man comes on, whatever we are doing, he's supposed to make it better. He's not supposed to drain you out of what you already have, right, Marion? Are we on the same page here? You're not talking much. I don't know why. Yes, last week you were. Oh, no, I'm trying to. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Valerie has something to say. We need to be prepared and, and positioned. And again, I think character speaks louder than anything in, in, the, in this text of Ruth, because her character literally just opened the door of favor for her to Boaz. Because you said Boaz did his research. So she knew that, okay, Naomi had Ruth had sacrificed a lot for her late husband. She's left everything that she knew and followed Naomi to a foreign land. And she came in all her beauty and aura, just humbled herself and was behind the maid servants of Boaz's field. So humility, she displayed that. All these gestures or characteristics from Ruth is something that we also need to pick up to be found by our Boaz. Or if I want to wait for my Boaz, Valerie, please go ahead. Amen. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I see your face though. That's this. <laughs> it's dark where I am. So. <laughs> so uh I want to talk about a little bit more about boys. You know, when you, you, you see the way boys when he came into the field, how he, he, he greeted his his uh, his the man that he was, was working for his field. He greeted him in the word of God. He said, God, give, the Lord be with you. So Boaz, like, it, 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 he's humble and he's respectful because if it was somebody else, he would not present that kind of greeting, of, of greeting to, to the people. So he respect people who work for him. Mm -hmm. So, and he, he fear God. He fear God. You, when, you, when you read about him, he fear God. If he wasn't fearing God, he would have left too to go to to, to different area to, to to look for her well but he stayed he stayed in the land that he, where he, he was and God made him a rich it like a rich man God provided for, for him so like let's say when we are looking for a man we are not just looking for this we have to look for somebody who who fears God somebody who obeys the word of God and because when somebody fears God, for him to do something better, he has to, he like, anyway, he, he, he walk according to God's word. So that's what I want to add. Okay, Marion, do you, uh, Marion, do you have something to say? Thank you, Valerie. Um, um, no, I, I, I think I said everything I said. I really want to hear from Faith. Yeah. Okay, maybe she's still driving. Um, so um, that's fine. I'm sure she will speak when she she can. Um, yeah, I think everyone pretty much 
covered it. Um, I'm excited about chapter three. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I just walked in the house. What were you saying? This is fake. I uh, wanted to hear what you had to say about chapter two or chapter one. Oh yeah, um, you know, God warns us against parasites and leeches. Uh, you know, it's okay for a woman to work, but the man is the provider, and the God, and God is, says that in no uncertain terms. And um, and you also need to make sure that you get along with their family as well, because um, Boaz knew about Ruth's family, or the family she identified with Naomi. So making sure that that's in line as well. God is not about hobo sexuality, men living off of women. And also God is not against hypergamy. What are these terminologies and what do they mean? Hobo sexuality means a man who, uh, who um, gets into a romantic relationship, whether it's under the disguise of marriage or just a sexual relationship as an excuse not to work. And he'll actually stalk a woman and try to come to her house. And if she has a house, you know, he'll uh, come and move in and under the skies of a relationship when the reality is he's just using her for money. So that's a hobo, H-O-B-O, -O, sexual. So we pray against that because it seems to be a, a growing trend in the church. And a lot of these church leaders are um, looking the other way or encouraging it. Titus 2 verse 2 speaks against it. And hypergamy uh, means when a woman mar marries up. I mean, again. He marries up. Marries a man that like ha has more than her financially or has more assets assets than her because I mean in the word you know God made sure that well again before he gave Adam Eve he gave him a job he gave him wealth you know Genesis talks about there being gold and silver buried deep in Eden so Adam was a very very wealthy man so God wants to make sure men have provision before you know they go ahead and marry I'm not trying to say I'm a gold digger, but I'm just saying, you know, shouldn't be married, nobody broke. Amen. Amen. I just want to say that it's 8.02. Um, if you feel that you've pressed for time, please, you're free to drop. Um, some of us are just going to stay on and continue with the book of Ruth. Um, it's insightful. We just want to learn. We can do a little bit of summary before if anyone wants to drop off, but I still want to really hear from a lot more people. Valerie, I really want to see your face. You're part of the coordinators of this thing, so <laughs> you have to show your face. And so, um, please, if, if you feel like you have something to do, we, res we respect your time, and we are very, very grateful that you joined us. Um, but we will continue to deliberate on Chapter 3. We'll stop after, cha you know, after Chapter 3, and we'll continue Chapter 4 next week. All right, Valerie, please go ahead. Uh, okay, so what I want to say is like when you read um, verse 8 and 9, I believe so, verse 8 and 9, when uh, they said, then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, with, will you not, do not go to grain in another field, nor go from here and say, uh, so on. So what I'm getting from this is that when it is this one always speak or, or also speak to even married people so when you are you are a lady and you are married to a man or you are you want it somebody don't go and be jump, jumping left and right so stay focused on the man the man that god has has given you do not <laughs> Right. <laughs> so what are you saying just so the people understand what you're saying is once you're married you're married don't be looking at another man or do, for the man not to be looking yes. at another man okay exactly because sometimes you're in a relationship we think that going somewhere else or somebody else present himself and promise us uh, this and that we are tempted to go maybe to that person Thinking that over there, it's maybe life is more uh, like, let's say, rose or pain like, than where we are. Instead of focusing on our own marriage, you saw with everything. Boaz said, stay here, do not go anywhere else. 
Okay, but for a woman to stay, there must be provision. For a woman to stay, there must be protection. For a woman to stay, I don't want to tell you my own story, but some of us left because none of that was provided. And that is not the that was not the main not reason why a woman we being abused, you know. <laughs> and, and so yeah, <laughs> so if there's abuse where the guy's trying to murder your destiny, you gotta go. Okay. Exactly. That's what. I'm, that's 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 exactly the point. Boaz said, "Stay here because you have provision, you have protection, you have what you what you need." You know. But some women they live in that situation, but they still go look around. I'm talking about something that I'm, <laughs> I know, I know about. You know, some women you have those provision, you have the protection that you need, but your eyes still outside. Well, that's why Marion said before a man marries a woman, you must do your research. It is important. I know of a story in London as I speak right now. Um, a girl that we were all in church with in London at the time, Marion, um, she married this one guy and um, the guy falls ill with something about the, the brains and now he's in a nursing home in London. She marries another guy and now the guy, the second guy also suffered the same illness that the first guy had, but the second one just died about a month ago. It is imperative for men to pray who their spouses should be. Just women are, we, we, we naturally pray for our spouses. We naturally get into the mood of prayer as to who our Boazes should be. But I think sometimes men just look at the visual. They look at the, the, the outside, the, the woman's figure or the woman's um, assets or whatever, the, the woman's beauty. But we all know that beauty goes beyond the outer looks. And so I think that, um, with, with what she's saying, a man can provide everything for you. And if the woman is still going out, there's an inner problem. There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an issue going on with a woman spiritually. And so once the man has done his homework, you will pick that up before you actually tie the knot to her. Uh, Minister Leslie, please, you're the man here. We, we need your vibe on this. As what, <laughs> what do you think? Because the other man I was trying to invite is at a program. So I'm sorry that you're going to be put on the, on the, but if you don't have anything to say too, we'll respect that, but we need a man's perspective about these things. Oh, yes. I want to hear, I definitely want to hear from the man. Cause I mean, I, I want to hear what, yeah, what the man has, to, what men have to say. And one thing I do want to say is that it seems like Ruth was very uh, feminine mm -hmm. um, and dan dante should I say? Um, and I know that's like a big thing these days, you know, there's a big thing about the whole, the modern woman and masculine woman and women not knowing how to uh, channel their masculinity or femininity. Uh, so I want to hear from Leslie. I want to hear what Leslie has to say. <laughs> uh, I think um, one thing that seems to be the theme of what most of you are saying is just um, honing in on the fact that a man is supposed to provide and a man is supposed to provide and all that. And, and I respect that. I mean, me personally, um, I want to be able to provide for my family. I want to be in a, in a place where even if my wife doesn't have to work, we'll would be fine, right? But then you also have to realize that some people are late bloomers. So um, that's one thing I want to kind of put out that we should not be so concerned about um, um, someone just based on what they have right now, but you should also consider potential. And when I say someone is a late bloomer, I mean those people that um, don't really um, realize what they are supposed to do or their purpose earlier in life. And so at the beginning, they're struggling a lot, but then they get to a point where they figure it out and it's like, oh, this is what I'm called to do. And then they enter into that field and they are making like the, the late, some late bloomers go from like nothing to like billionaires. So um, would you rather lose out on someone like that because you didn't see the potential? Um, so we have to kind of um, be particular about that too. Just look at the person. What is the person doing? How much work are they trying to do? 
in this in this particular um text that we are reading it's clear that the man was already wealthy like he is this he's that but um just the point that out uh, some people are late bloomers but you have to appreciate the potential amen amen i have to man who else to say is that valerie go ahead how do you have valerie okay go ahead you can go first valerie Yes, uh, let's see. It's true, you know, we have late bloomers, but what I want to say is that the woman has to have to see in you that potential because, yeah, it's true that you are a late bloomer, that you have to show that you have that potential, that you are trying, even though you are a late bloomer. So you have to show that to, 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 to the lady because there are some men that they will just sit down, they, will, they don't really do anything, you know, they don't try, they don't make any efforts. You, you speak you speak with a lot of passion. Why is something <laughs> going on? <laughs> well, something did go on. <laughs> no, I, I, so like uh, Valerie said what I was, you know, pretty much gonna say, like, is he actively pursuing, you know, what he needs to pursue or actively doing what he needs to do? to get to the level that he needs to get to in order to provide. I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying that I don't want you to misinterpret what I, the message I'm trying to convey because I don't want it to come across as, oh yeah, he has to make X, Y, and Z in the finances. Oh, he has to make over six figures or X, you know, things of that nature. Like, no, but there has to be a level of provision that he should already have to just in case, you know what I'm saying? Because God made the man head of the household. I think that's mm. super important. And I think in these times and days, you know, the, the gender roles have been reversed. Now women are making just as much more or even more than men, you know, and it's not supposed to be like that. So that's why I, I again, I wasn't trying to push a certain narrative, but I just wanted to uh, drill down on that message and because possibility versus probability are two different things. You know, he can have a lot of ambition, but if he doesn't have drive and if he's not actively pursuing it or working, you know, it's just, it's like beating a dead horse. You're going to get at a dead end. So I, that's why I was honing in on the provision part because it's important. And, you know, we're African, most of us are African. Well, yes, yeah, we're all actually, we're all African. So <laughs> like, it's important, you know, no one wants their daughter to go into a household where, you know, the one man that's getting married to their daughter can't take care of them. That's a big important thing uh, to most women. And Faith, do you want to chime in? To the family, sorry. Oh yeah, First Timothy 5.8 is very clear. It says a man who does not provide for his own home is worse than a, a, an, an atheist. And then 1 Timothy 3, 5 says, a man who cannot lead his own household has no business in church leadership. I didn't write the Bible. Ephesians 4, 28 says, a man who doesn't work should eat. So what happens if someone doesn't eat? They starve and they die, right? So if God is insinuating they should be starved, I don't think I as a mere mortal should say men should not work. I think, <laughs> Leslie, I think, um, welcome, Sam. Um, Sam, it'll be nice to see your face and... Um, second man on the platform to give your insight or your thoughts about what we are discussing. Um, to add to what Leslie said and what you all have said, Faith will reach out anybody who comes in and say something else. But um, I think that maybe before the people, the couple, if they're deciding to get married, they do get married. I think that vision should be written down. Okay, maybe I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Like you said, late, like the person is a late boomer. This is one I want to attain. And maybe if the woman is smart as well, she would try and help him. And now trying to help you get to your vision or your goal, we want to see how the men react to a woman pushing you to trying to make it. Because some men object to that. And I have had that experience where, okay, you're not where you're supposed to be at. Okay, let me help you get to where you're supposed to get to. But there is, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's this laid back, there's this um, restriction, what's it called? I don't know what to call it, but they don't, what did you say? 
nonchalant attitude. Yeah, they don't want to. So when you see that, then there's nothing you can actually work with. But if the man is responding to you, encouraging him, if the man is responding, hey, let's do it this way. Let's say for five years, let's get into this investment. And he's working hand in hand with you. Definitely, he's going to achieve his vision or his goals and be the kind of man that he sees himself doing, but he just needed a help mate right to get it done but if the men are going to reject that kind of help then he just wants to be comfortable and then leech off you like faith is saying and there's a lot of them a lot of i'm sorry to say a lot of lazy men out there whether they are pastors or not pastors there are a lot of them out there so we are saying that is a god-given man that you, that god will send you away it is up to us the women to be wise and discerning and prayerful to make sure that whoever we decide to cohabit with is what God has ordained for us. And if that is the thing, it shouldn't just be marriage, marriage, what is God's purpose for this union? Whatever, when he, Ruth got together with Boaz, it was to trigger the lineage of Jesus Christ. Every woman, every man's ambition or goal should be, God, what do you want this relationship to bring to your kingdom? That's the objective of it. Every, every, every story in the Bible has a God purpose, God ordained goal in it and why it came to pass. Sam, welcome to the platform. I don't know if you want us to, get, we, we can see your face or just, just know who you are and just talk to you and you share your, your, your thoughts as well. Uh, Faith, Mama Lucy is busy with baby J, but my, again, we, we, we would need your wisdom somewhere along the line to help us because we try and get married. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to hide anything on this platform. We are going to get married, but we just want to make sure that we're walking according to the word of God and making the right choices for us. Sam, is there anything you want? To it's Nyasha. Why'd you come with the name Sam? <laughs> it's my, my, mad, my maiden name Sambana. So I just use Sam. Hot child. <laughs> Thank <I'm> you. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh, we're just talking about the book of Ruth and how God used her, irrespective of her background and the challenges she went through and the posture she took before she became a wife or even the mm -hmm. things she did. Mario, you can, we can just delve a little bit into chapter three and we can wrap it up. I don't know. Please, again, if you are tired, um, you're one out of the session, it's okay. We don't give a little you know we don't give a little bit of limitation to it we want to go deeper and deeper but if you feel you're one out and you want to drop we will respect that um but we were just about to wrap up in a few minutes again if you have um any questions any concerns contributions just raise your hand and we'll, we'll have it in an orderly manner so thank you so much miss nasha for coming it would be nice to see your face though on my face today yeah it's not your face tomorrow your face <laughs> Next week, I'll be ready. All right, darling. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Miss Maria, you can take over. Thank you. Okay, so I will be reading from Ruth chapter three, Ruth at the threshing floor. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now, do as I tell you. Take a bath and put on some perfume and a dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you. Sorry, don't let Boaz see you until he's until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor at night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. Should I continue? I wanted you to stop so you can break it down over there. I think there's a lot happening right, right at the top. Yeah. Um, um, you can go ahead or if anyone else wants to go ahead, it's fine. But you can go ahead and give right at the top. Mother said, my daughter, shall I not give you rest? That alone is heavy. Mm -hmm. 
that is, do, do you want to go ahead with it or you want me to? Uh, you can talk and then I can go after you. It's fine. Okay. So when she said rest, she's realized that, hey, Ruth, you've come with me all the way from Moab. Your husband has passed on. You've come here. You want to glean in the, in the field of Mo, um, Boaz. Now I want to make sure that you're settled. I want to make sure that you remarry. I want to make sure that you carry the name from, uh, you carry, you know, I think they had a culture in, in the Jewish um, um, section then where if um, a son marries someone else and they don't have children, a relative in the family has to take over that wife and bear a son so that the lineage, the family name continues and is, and is, and is a, it's a tradition that they have. I think somewhere in Luke, it says that seven, seven brothers marries one bride. I think someone asked the question to Jesus, if this one dies and marries, the, you know, if my brother dies and although he's married and he does not leave any children, can the other brother marry? So is it is a culture that is in that um, dispensation where um, there's no child and there are family members. And so Naomi is saying, Ruth, rest. So when a man comes into your life, rest. If you're doing 10 jobs just to, just to support that man, rest, rest spiritually, rest economically, rest financially. I don't know what you want to call it, Ili, but there should be rest. There should be some settlement in your life. So Naomi is saying, I want to give you rest. And so I guess, Marion, you go further down and she's giving her the tactics, what she should, she's educating her. That's why I said, Mama Lucy, we need wisdom. And so we need to find women of wisdom that would also, you know, direct us in our courtship or marriage that we're going into, that we do the right thing. There's another thing I'll say about this, but we see that she's concerned about her daughter-in-law. I want to see you get married again. I want to see you give me children because my husband is gone. All my sons are gone. Now there's no son and sons were very important in that culture. There's no son that was going to bear our names, right? And so I want to make sure that you are good. Marian, go ahead if you want to say something. I think verse three is very important as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, honestly, yeah, this chapter is definitely loaded uh, from the time that we see Naomi concerned about Ruth's well-being making sure that you know she has a proper home and she has a man because she realized of course she's young so she has you know even though she is a widow she has time to get met, remarried and you know possibly give birth um so her well-being was very important to her but we also see Ruth I'm sorry we also see Naomi act as a mother and a mentor to Ruth by instructing her on what to do. Naomi was very smart and vigilant because she noticed that, okay, Boaz has been, been very nice to you, overly nice to you, very generous. Because if we calculate the barley that she went home with, uh, even when she, well, I don't want to escape over, but when she left the field, she had gallons. It was gallons of barley. And, you know, after she leaves the threshing floor, He's going to make sure she has enough gallons, a measure of barley, you know? So he, she, Naomi saw what uh, the items that Boaz was giving to her. No man is going to invest in you and give you items that he, you know, if he's not interested. Like what man is just going to freely give you something? Like, I know there's a saying, nothing's free, right? Uh, with these men, especially these days, you know, like men are, if they're paying and giving, acting, giving you stuff, like, it comes at a cost. So like we knew that he, she could tell that now uh, that uh, Boaz was really interested in, in uh, Ruth and Ruth probably was oblivious and was like, oh, okay, he's just being nice. I don't know. And so now was like, no, you need to take a bath. And this is where we see, you take a bath, put on some perfume, put on your nicest dress. Th this right, th that part alone should let us know men are visual, okay? And perfume was created to drive the opposite sex crazy. Just like cologne was created to drive the opposite sex crazy. So it's important for us as humans to smell good, <laughs> especially the women, because you know that's important. We see that here, and then we also when we get into Esther, we're gonna we're gonna learn about the beauty treatments that she went through um, with the perfume. It's very important. 
uh, for women. And it's also important to just have that nice dress. You know, I don't want to bring circular artists into this, but Beyonce has a song called Freaking Dress. You know, women, you should have that nice garment that turns heads, that, you know, makes, that, that leaves a lasting impact on that man. Because again, men are visual and we're learning that here. So it's very, very important. And uh, Naomi was very specific and strategic about why she told Ruth to go to the threshing floor. She knew nobody would be there, number one. So it'll be a great place for her to position herself. Now, some may say, okay, you know, well, Naomi and Ruth kind of chased him. I, I don't believe that. I believe she positioned herself because Boaz was throwing little hints here and then. Sometimes men are slow to act. You know, sometimes they're trying to test you and see, so they're not going to be forthcoming. They're just trying to tread lightly. And plus, you know, Boaz was older when she was younger. He's probably like, she don't want me. You know, I'm going to be nice to her and everything like that, but I, I don't believe she wants me. And we'll see that later. But I believe that Ruth, was, Ruth and Naomi, they were very strategic and they positioned them de themselves and it was the right positioning. And also it showed humility because she didn't go and lay with him like fully in the bed or wherever he was laying. Like she laid at his feet. So that's a sign of humility and, and uh, selflessness. So I just wanted to point that out. Amen. Um, to also add to what Myron is saying, we see the perfume is being used here or being washing yourself. When we get married, not now, perfume, put perfume on yourself, buy nice lingerie when you're getting into your stuff with your husband for us to be getting married. So don't just go and put powder on your face and put some headband and just, no, perk it up, perk it up, ladies. It's, it's here in the Bible, Ruth chapter three, verse three. So wash and anoint, take a bath, right? Wash and anoint yourself, um, Naomi was saying. And so do that. Please go ahead. When it says that she laid at his feet, I realized that, you remember the story, the, the woman with the alabaster box? She broke the oil and washed Jesus's feet. There's something about going down, like, I beg your pardon, like just bowing down at the feet of Jesus is a form of humility, like you said. And also, I think that with the history, the historical data that I found, Boaz is a symbolism of a redeemer, okay? And Ruth is, is a symbolism of the Gentile church. And so we see that Boaz is trying to redeem Ruth. And that's what Christ came to do for us. And so we see her at the posture of humility, at the posture of worship for Boaz at your feet. I'm here to serve you as a maid servant, as a wife, but I came all prepped up, dressed up, washed up, anointed, perfume, looking good for you, right? But then she goes, at what time, Marian? What time does she position herself? The time that he has eaten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a timing. <laughs> Go ahead. No, sorry. I was going to say that after you're done, but you, you finished. No, you go ahead, please. I'm talking too much. Okay. So yeah. So like the, and this is not the first time this has happened in the Bible. When a woman goes to a man after he's finished eating and drinking, because men are more reluctant to say yes, when they are full and happy and in high spirits. So women, you know, if you're seeking something from your man, it's very important to ask them after they've, you know, been fed and they've been drinking, because it says, uh, I didn't get to read it, but it does say that he was in high spirits. You know, if we look at other men in the Bible, uh, where they had been eating and drinking, uh, and the women came to ask for certain things, they were more reluctant to get a yes instead of a no because the man had been physically satisfied. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. I just want to bring that up. We're also going to learn that when we read Esther because there were countless times that she had a banquet for the king and you know he kept asking her what she wanted and she wanted to make sure he was full and happy and, 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 and drunk off of, well, not drunk off of wine, but you know had enough wine before she can ask and get the answer she needed. So it's very important as women to feed your man <laughs> and make sure he has enough to drink. So in case you need this one day, you need to ask him a very hard question. Uh, once he's in high spirits, it's just easy to get a yes. So, yeah. Any contributions, please, from Sam, uh, Miss Nasher, Leslie, what do you think? <laughs> uh, Valerie, Faith, and Mama. Mama, I know you're, you're swamped with, uh, you're swamped with uh, baby Jay. 
But Leslie, what do you think about this, um, this posture of Ruth? Um, she lying at the feet of Boaz at a certain time of the evening. Um, but Mario, you're going to have to talk about the covering. Yes, I wanted to give some other people the opportunity. Okay. <laughs> Faith? I think, I think Nasha definitely has something to say. <laughs> she always speaks a lot of wisdom. So Nasha, we're waiting for you. But while she's getting ready, um, well, I think Ruth's um, uh, posture was still being submissive both to Naomi and also to um, uh, Boaz. Um, yeah, and um, not not to say it in a way that um, uh, men are full of themselves or whatever, but men like submission, like a, a woman that is is trying to tell you that hey, look, I'm I'm actually respecting you. I am trying to give you this reverence. I'm submitting to you. Men like that. Hey, men appreciate that. So. As a tip from a man right here, I'm telling you, <laughs> submission is very attractive to a lot of men. And so there you have it. Uh, okay, we are work in progress. Miss, <laughs> Miss Nasha, what do you have to say? Her box is lit up. I'm not sure if she's talking or we can't hear. Asha, can you hear us? Okay, what about Miss Faith? Miss Faith, what do you think? Valerie. Okay, I'll pick you back off that, Leslie. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what Leslie said is true. Men definitely love submission. You know, the Bible tells us, you know, that women should submit to their husbands and that men should uh, love their wives as Christ loved the church because these are two things that we as the opposite sex kind of find hard to do. Um, if the Bible is commanding it, there's a reason why, you know, God made mention of that. You know, at times it is hard for women to submit to their husbands, especially when the men have not created the environment for us to submit to them, you know, in, in, in this uh, situation or circumstance with Ruth and Boaz, they, like Leslie said earlier, they complimented each other. So it was easy for them to release such characteristics. It was easy for Ruth to submit to him. It was easy for Boaz to respect her, regardless of, you know, the tribe or people she came from. So, and as women too, like, it's hard for us to respect the man, you know, at times, you know, so especially if, you know, uh, Case in point, I hate to bring this up. If a woman is doing financially better than a man and, you know, she might look down on him because she feels like he's not adequate enough for her. And you get, there are some women that um, are, are, you know, that find it hard to respect their men in that, in that regard. And then you also have at times where um, a woman might be more successful, not in finances, just in something else in life, you know, and she might look down on her husband or she's more intelligent than him. She might look down on him and not respect him. And so the Bible says that, you know, women, should, we should always uh, submit and be, res and be respectful. And, and the, the same thing goes to the man. So what Les said is very, very true. Right? Men like to have the ego stripped. And women, we like words of affirmation. So I think, you know, men, they really don't know how to articulate themselves uh, at times and, you know, release those words of affirmation. And we read it here, Boaz continuously release words of affirmation as well as prayer over Ruth. Uh, so it's not just a lesson for us women, but it's also a lesson for the men. Amen. Man, amen. Thank you for that. So anyone else has something to say, Faith or Sam or Valerie? <clears throat> Promise you we can wrap up. Um... I, I just want to ask a question, especially sure. to, to Leslie. Hey. <laughs> I know you asked so much question earlier today. Do you see, Leslie, do you think that the a lady should propose to the to a man? Oh boy. Oh. <laughs> So 
Um, because when you when you read it, when you read uh, root three verse nine, you see that uh, uh, root is the one who has like a was going for boas. It's not boas going to her like going and lay on the feet and uncover her her legs, uh, uncover his legs and all of that. So root this was kind of doing so. <laughs> Miss Bella is laughing. So do you think that a lady should have that kind of approach or is left to a man? I think, hey, Marion, you go. All right, we wanna hear from the guys. You go, please. I, I can go after you. It seems like your comment was like itching to come out, so. No, you're good. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, well, um, all I can say about that is um, it is, I, I think where we find ourselves today, there's nothing really wrong with that, um, that a woman actually expresses interest in a man and she um, is able to voice that out. But I think you have to find creative ways of doing it. You don't necessarily have to put yourself out there like, look, I love you, come on, take me already. <laughs> you have to find creative ways of doing it. Um, perhaps um, you went out and you send a message or um, call the next day just to appreciate the fact that um, you really enjoyed yourself and you're looking forward to um, another time like that. So that's already giving him signs and clues. Okay, all right. So he's interested. She um, appreciates me and the little that I was able to do for her. Um, and then eventually what you want is for it to be mechanical and natural. The chemistry should grow. You don't want um, to force yourself on him because um, when you... Um, it's like a balance, right? When when you go too low, then it's not going to respect you so much. Now he's gonna, um, in some cases, it's not gonna respect you, and he's gonna look at you like, um, uh, sorry to use the word like um, cheap or desperate. Yeah, uh huh. You don't want to appear desperate, but I don't think there's anything wrong with actually. Um, showing your interest in the man. You just have to be creative with it. That's all I can say. All right. Hmm. Marion, do you have anything else to say? That, no, that's very good. Uh, when I was reading this, um, I mean, that's what most of the stuff that I found from the scholars were saying. I mean, that, that's, that was what Ruth was doing um, at the time. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't want to speak too much. Marion, go ahead. But it's it's a beautiful gesture from her part, I guess. Maybe some scholars were saying that because he was older, he didn't feel like it was right, yeah. you know, for him to do that. But since Ruth showed that interest, um, so first of all, when they uncovered the feet, it was for it was intentional for him to get cold to wake up, because she didn't want anyone to see that she had come to the threshing floor. So she came up in the evening as well. So she didn't want to wake him up by herself. So she uncovered his feet. Definitely when you get cold in the field, it's going to be your feet. And so that woke him up and then saw now uh, saw Ruth and said, who is this lady? And said, your maid servant or whatsoever. Um, yeah, but the symbol of her asking him, cover me with your, like whatever, your blanket, according to the traditions of the, of the land, that is a symbol of saying, will you marry me? Like cover me. They use a scenario like those that are married when it's a cold winter season, they cuddle up in bed together with a blanket. So why should Ruth go there and say, cover me with whatever is covering you? I mean, what is that? We are not, you know. So they were saying it was a gesture of saying, dude, <laughs> will you marry me? And uh, he said, wait, there's somebody else ahead of me. Let me go check. So Marion, please chip in. Again, we can wrap up here and continue next week, but Marion, speak your mind. Let's faith and everybody speak and then we can go Oh, But yeah, Leslie, thank you for that. I just don't know how I can propose to a man though at this age of mine. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I agree with you on the proposal, you know, I, I, 
fake world would say this is the strangeness in the land uh, because you know there's a lot of videos and articles you read now with women proposing to men and women bending down on one knee and asking men to marry them I, I'm sorry I'm not with it I I, I don't agree with it um, you know the man was created to, uh, men are natural hunters uh, men like to pursue men are for the game and for the chase. And I am not with the gender roles being reversed and me pursuing a man. I, I just don't, I don't recommend any woman doing it. Cause I feel like also if you do that, if you're the one that chases the man, um, he's not eventually he's not really going to respect you and he's going to so he said you're going to be like cheap or desperate yeah, you're be cheap. Yeah. He's gonna, and he's going to want in his mind he's going to be like okay well do you do this with all the other guys you talk to or have dated like men and they just there's certain things they cannot erase from their minds there's certain things that women we we do and we say that we can't come back from so you have to be very very meticulous with how you uh uh, now I want to say pursue a man, how you position yourself. I do believe in there's a way for you to kind of maybe be a little flirtatious or kind of give him key signals that you're interested with that, like overly being assertive or, you know, coming off as desperate. Because again, men are, they remember that stuff and they will not value you. It's, it's important. So I'm with you ladies on that. I don't believe as women were supposed to be chasing men. Now back in this time, you know, uh, there was certain reason in there as to why Ruth had to do what she did. If she didn't, she may never have married Boaz because again, he thought she wasn't on, even on his radar because he was older. So he thought he never would have a chance with her. And so, you know, it, every situation is different. Um, but I don't believe she, you know, really chased him. I just believe she positioned herself. And also too, you know, they were very strategic and they were watching him. They knew his pattern. They knew he would be there winnowing the barley. They knew he'll be alone. They knew he was, he spends the night there. He sleeps there. They knew all his movements and activity. So when you ever, you're talking to a guy and he's kind of moving slow, you got to start doing your research. You got to start watching the patterns. You can position yourself at the right time. Amen. Words of wisdom. Thank you. Amen. Nasha, is there anything else? Yes, no, I was just um I was just gonna say that like um I, I never really looked at I mean I kind of like saw it as a marriage proposal, but uh what it shows me like uh Ruth was uh submissive, uh as Leslie said, and he said that a lot of men like submissive women. So I asked Leslie what does submission mean? Hey <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's submit one unto another. Ay, ay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Mama Lucy, we need you in here, please. Leslie, I told you you're going to be working overtime today, please. No, I thought Nasha had her own comments to come make, and she's over here. But <laughs> 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 she's coming for me. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> when, I, when I talk about submission, I'm not saying that... Um, you literally do everything that he tells you to do. As you said, you submit one to another. Um, I think that um, being submissive is more a thing of um, understanding and just being um, um, reasonable and in, in accepting his direction, okay? Because as we know, while, um, uh, God is the head. There's this like um, triangle that um, you read about. It's like you guys have God at the top and then um, the man and the woman at the bottom. But then there's like this hierarchy of God is the head of you guys. Then the man comes and then the woman comes. So just respecting that hierarchy and respecting the man as the head of the family, even though God is a covering for both of you. So um, I don't know if I could be any more specific, but that's that's what I was um, referring to, Nasha. You so can it's, come it's, back and, and, and keep up with your attack. <laughs> so it's not the African stuff like you shall do it as I say, or else I'm just joking. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm messing with <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, I, think, I think it's just um, within reasonable boundaries. Like I say something, and, and that's why I keep talking about being creative about it because um, sometimes 
it's the way you put it across. He could be like wrong. Just what he said is just out of place. It's not going to work for you. But the way you say it or how um, you go about letting him understand that. But have you checked out this alternative? I think this actually works better for us. Is the way you put it, but if you just say no, that's that's just dumb. I'm not doing that. Now you're gonna have problems. So, it's because as um um, uh, Marion and I agreed earlier, um, men have egos, and so the moment where you are literally telling him is wrong, yeah, you, that's the beginning of like uh, uh <laughs> the world war that we are trying to <laughs> stop right now. Um, yeah. That's good. I was just going to add that, like, um, as I said, like, submit, it's submitting one unto another. And as someone is directed by God, but you're not going to jump and do every single thing he says if he's not being led of God. I'm not going to, it's difficult to follow someone who's saying, well, let's go and kill someone. So you have to apply wisdom uh, to the direction that's coming from the head of that household, but mostly on your knees. That's just my little, my two cents. It, the, the head is God and God will give direct. It's like less talking and more time on your knees for if you're dealing with a stubborn person. I was about to say, if you're dealing with somebody that is not hearing from God, what, what are you going to do? You're, uh, praying, you're on your knees as a woman. You're praying. The guy is not hearing. What, what are you, you going to do? Uh, it's, it's, it's God. I mean, it's, it, I mean, God is, God is one that comes and steps into a situation and it works. I'm not saying it works all the time, but, um, it's like you, applying wisdom and like what Leslie said, like understanding how to talk and when to talk and talk and when to approach the King. That's, that, that's kind of like what I, what I heard from what he was saying. And I agree with that. I've, I've been, this is my 12th year of marriage, I think. And <laughs> I've survived. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I'm, think, I'm, I'm, I'm very independent. So it's, it's, it's um, taken a lot of God taming me over the years and like understanding what his word means and understanding what submission is. And it's, it's love. It's like loving the person as yourself, giving yourself like it, loving the person as you'd like them to love you even if they don't give what you're giving them but then you do your part because you can't control how what a person says or how they see you that's all wow thank you thank you well we see what your question has caused but it's a good question Marion, do you have something to add to it or do you want us to end here No, I don't have anything to say. Uh, everyone made some great inputs and thanks, Sam. I was uh, really good what you and Lizzie said. So I just, I'm happy everyone's contributing. So yeah. what about Faith? Do you have anything to say, Faith? No, I'm good. Okay. So you're leaving it to me, I guess, that we just muted your thingy. <laughs> right. <laughs> All yours. Oh, yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We can do chapter four next week. Um, what we intend to do on this platform is honestly, we just want to learn from one another. And so we read the books and Myron is the one putting the curriculum together. What we're trying to do is we might get this, uh, someone else to type the recording that we've done. So we can, if we can come up with whatever curriculum for other people to, to learn, we would do that. Um, but we just want to go back home, read Texas and come back and and share what the Lord is telling us based on what text that we have read. We'll start with the women in the book, in the Bible, then we would tackle some other books. But our intention is to learn together as, as a body of Christ or as sisters, mothers, brothers. And if we can finish the whole Bible next year, two years, it's, it's okay. It's just a fellowship. We just wanna be here um, and just learn from one another. So thank you so much for coming, contributing. You've stayed over an hour, it's, it's, it's great. Thank you. Um, Please, if there's any other subject that you also want to learn more, you can always reach out to Marian, Valerie, or myself, that we, we can just come on here and learn from one another. Thank you so much, Ms. Nasher. I know you're busy. Mama Lucy, thank you so much for joining us. 
Faith, I bless you and thank you for joining us, Mr. Clote. I couldn't say any more, but thank you so much for joining us. And my own lovely Dovies, our lovely uh, Valerie and Miss Bella. It's been a great honor. But again, we're taking the character of Ruth home. One, two, three, four, four women on here. We, we want to get married or remarried, whatever it is. And so I am going to anoint myself, perfume myself, be humble, position myself, not when I propose to a man, but position myself, um, be, be submissive. The things that we've learned that Ruth did, but Ruth was hardworking. Ruth was not lazy, even though she married a wealthy man. We don't know what happened after that, but she was a hardworking lady that positioned her. But her character is what really attracted Boaz. Because Boaz did his research, realized that she was very good to Naomi, treated her husband well, gave up her sacrifice, her culture, her own, her, her own country, and came to serve another God she knew nothing about. That was beautiful in the eyes of Boaz. And so if there's anything else that we can learn as women, those that are already married, continue to be beautiful in the eyes of your husband. Those that are seeking marriage, that will beautify ourselves with the word of God. And that will cause us to be humble and beautiful before God. Hey, our Boaz is coming. That's my, that's my mantra right now. My Boaz is coming. Amen and amen. Please, Mama Lucy, is there anything you want to say? Leslie, Faith, Sam, anybody else? And then we'll say good night. Thank you so much for joining us. And that was a no. <laughs> so thank you. And have a good night, please. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Love you. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye. God bless.